to look at. <clears throat> Okay, um, what we're going to be doing uh, today is uh, going through what you would go through if uh, you were responsible for setting, for helping uh, set up uh, a, uh, a memorial service. Okay. <laughs> that, that would presume we know how to. Yeah. Okay. Does that help? Is that better? Okay. Goodbye noise back there. We'll see you next time. <laughs> okay. So, uh, if a person that you're uh, close to uh, uh, has died, uh, you'll be getting together with the pastor, and uh, the pastor will be helping you uh, set up a worship service. The pastor uh, will probably have all the prayers and welcomes and you know, all that kind of stuff. What you uh, will be most helpful for would be to uh, uh, do one, two, three things. One is if there are special hymns that would be meaningful at that particular time, uh, and if there would be uh, scripture passages uh, that also would be meaningful. And now some of it may have come from the person who has passed away that you're aware of, uh, and uh, uh, others are, are, are just, it, the service is basically not for the person who has died, but for the people who are there. Uh, and uh, it, the, the cause of the getting together, of course, is the, the person who has passed away. Uh, so we come together as family. We just experienced that, that this uh, bulletin is uh, the one that was used for my brother Kent that uh, just uh, uh, passed away. Uh, and uh, there is the, the sadness of losing someone. But the most powerful experience that I think uh, Gwen and I had it, and the, uh, the other people uh, also, was the benefit of gathering together as family and, and close friends of the person who has died. What for? For comfort and reflection on life that uh, uh, is related, of course, to, to the person who has died. In the service, um, I, as, a, as a pastor, my focus was always the service and the message is going to go with it. Uh, but for uh, most people, the, there also uh, is a focus on the eulogy. That is, somebody uh, who is able to do it, not fall completely apart but is able to do it and articulate uh, beneficial uh, real life stuff of the person uh, who has died. Uh, once in a while, uh, uh, I was asked uh, to do that part of it also, but what I, I was really dependent upon was a written statement. Oftentimes it's the statement that's in the bulletin. Um, and because uh, I, I don't know probably any of the individuals uh, in the congregation as well as the people themselves. So um, I, I suppose in, in my father's uh, 
generation, there was very little that was said about the person who was dying. It was all the message that comes from Christianity uh, about death and new life uh, and God's involvement uh, in, in, in our lives. And, and that is uh, obviously good stuff to remember and uh, learn about uh, when we are faced directly with death. So as we would uh, uh, go through uh, the, the service then, um, there, as you have in, the, in this, uh, uh, usually the, the first thing would be some kind of welcoming and greeting that, this, that uh, has the person's name who has died. And, it, and so it's a reflection on we are coming together because of and, uh, and, and look at life in the light of uh, the death that has occurred. The prayers, uh, probably uh, your pastor is the one that is, will, would be selecting uh, the, the, the different prayers. We would get into then uh, hymns, and uh, you, you have have a list uh, list here of some suggested hymns uh, that you know has been gathered together, uh, and uh, oftentimes uh, the hymn, some of the hymns uh, are related to. What you, what you know of the person who has died has passed away. But uh, probably the most meaningful ones are the ones that you yourself uh, uh, really appreciate, uh, and particularly at the time of, well, not just at the time of death, but that, that are a part of a celebration of life. And uh, so you, you, know, you see the, the, the different hymns that are, are there. Uh, find the online, find the presence or whatever it is, uh, the rest of it. Um, my dad, uh, I'd have to look it up now. My dad had a special hymn uh, that uh, I always liked uh, at, uh, at funerals. And certainly, we used it at, at his uh, at his service. Um, the service itself is actually two, and sometimes they're combined, as they have been here. Uh, this this service was done uh, at the site of burial, uh, and the, we did the whole worship service. Had a soloist, and you know all kinds of. Uh, Stuff that worked out uh, quite well, but <clears throat> the the structured way would be there'd be a service at the church. Sometimes the body is there. Uh, uh, depends on how you want to do it. Uh, the ashes, maybe. Uh, other times, you know, as a straight memorial service, it, you just have pictures, you know, that kind of a thing. And then, <clears throat> uh, and then. At the graveside uh, is what's called the committal. We have uh, uh, have that in a one paragraph, basically, at the end of, of this uh, this service. But the committal oftentimes uh, is uh, I don't know if I'd say limited, but uh, usually it's uh, family. Uh, and and uh, probably some close friends. Uh, not the, most of the time, not you know, I would say all the time. Not the whole congregation that came for the service. It's very short. Um, my my dad and my mom's. I don't think it was fifteen minutes long. And it's a placing the body there. 
and, uh, and, and once again, commending uh, that person into the hands of the Lord. That's what it is. Uh, and uh, the focus of new life uh, as, uh, as God has designed for humanity as we understand it. As we understand it. So, you look through uh, those uh, hymns and, and scripture passages, um, that, that probably would be very helpful. Um, and that's basically it. Very, uh, what would you say? Intimate and simple process. You're working out with the pastor uh, how the service is going to go, what the major emphasis is going to be. And that's why it's very important to um, for you, I many times they would just turn it over uh, to me uh, to decide what the major uh, scripture passage was going to be because there the message is going to be related to that. And, uh, and 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 that's that's it. Yeah. Here, can we maybe talk about the difference between a memorial service, a celebration of life, and a funeral? I think there are some differences there. Please share the differences. <laughs> well, you know, for me personally. I, I lean more towards the liturgical funeral, where the emphasis is on resurrection and and not on the person itself who oh. has died. Right. Is how I personally view a celebration of life. Right. And I, I think that affects the tone. It affects the lessons you would choose. It would affect the uh, hymns. And I, I'd encourage people to look at hymns besides. Um, like, Favorite hymns or? Yeah, what's the one? Amazing Grace. That's <laughs> fine, you know. Oh. I had to choose a hymn of my father's because it was very important to him, but it, he would never sing that at my funeral. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. It's interesting for, for myself. Um, I, I don't know that. I particularly want to in influence my service because it's once again it's for the people and so it has to be their focus. And but, but aren't they interested in message? Mm -hmm. Does this a lot of friends like the things you choose to pull them back maybe from their grief with a song or a lesson? I I feel responsibility I guess uh, in in participating in the planning of that. Yeah. If it's my my focus would be if it's needed. Uh, but uh, for for my service, I I I, I don't, the, the most that I could do. And I thought a little bit about this is uh, at some point I might write uh, a message that it that that I would share while they're still alive or while I'm still alive about uh, kind of the whole message of Christianity um, that maybe something about the giftedness of life, one emphasis that uh, is important. But, but that doesn't have to be at that service. It can be if they so choose. Uh, and uh, so, so I'm, I, I, I'm not gonna design this at all. Yeah, so, so and right, and, but yeah, as uh, Carol was indicating, that is something 
that you can do. And, and so there's, there's a whole lot of variable ways that the service can be done. Um, I, I don't get real excited when the eulogy goes on and has um, so many more uh, I, I told my people. family, no eulogy. Oh. <laughs> Save it for the wine. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, you can see the, the, the different ways that the service can be and has been designed. Uh, I was at one service for a, a, a school principal, teacher, and so forth. I think it was two and a half hours long. And, and, uh, and most of that, very little was uh, any kind of liturgy stuff. Uh, it was all, uh, everybody had to get up and tell their story, you know, so, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add when my mom died, she died at three in the morning, didn't have a lot of notes that this was gonna happen. And so by two o'clock that next afternoon after no one had sleep, our family gathered, my sister and brother and I, to talk with our pastor about what we were going to do. And my mom had helped me write her obituary. She was just very, she just said, why don't you write it and let me look at it? And, which I love, that really helped me. So I knew I honored her. It wasn't long, but it included important things. But when we came to meet with the pastor, first of all, I love that part of the Cleso structure was beautiful worship service in a way, but we felt really pressured to come up with those hymns and Bible verses in that moment. You know, so I really think if we even tell our children some things about what we like, we wanted it to be something special for my mom and us. Mm -hmm. But you don't have much time. You know, when you're the person that's going to help make that service happen, you just don't have that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We had some of that pressure uh, with this. And then we actually, the the uh, pastor, uh, Don Reese, uh, was not there. He's a, a close friend of my brother's. My brother was, what, 93. And he was probably the same age, and he was sick that day. And uh, so, um, uh, David, you know, Ken's son, uh, who was also a little pastor, he jumped in and uh, had us do a few things and uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, oftentimes there can be last minute <laughs> you know, kinds of things. So, uh, today, um, uh, basically since uh, COVID um, there's been a big difference oftentimes uh, and like with Ken he died a month ago uh, and so there's there's a long period of time for the memorial service uh, and uh, uh, so that, that's one big difference uh, for me uh, the, other, the other thing is uh, I haven't done a funeral for 20 years. And, and, uh, and so some of, well, yeah, okay. I, so one, one in 20 some years, you know. Uh, and uh, so uh, there's, there's some, how would I say? Lack of sharpness, let's put it, let's put it that way. Uh, and hopefully, like the night of service, why we got it back together. <laughs> you know, so. you know, the other thing, Bill, that you sent about is the medal for both of my parents' services and for Nina. We all stayed and filled the grave. We put the dirt in the grave. And for me and for a lot of people, that was very meaningful. Um, we, we stayed and, and uh, finished the service. But it was a small group of family members there. Um, and we actually finished putting the dirt in the grave. Yeah. Uh, for moms, uh, we practically filled the whole thing up. <laughs> and, well, and, and like for Ken, um, there, uh, uh, he, he was uh, cremated. Uh, and uh, before, we actually left uh, the uh, 
graveyard people uh, put the uh, you know ashes into into the spot, and uh, when we were we were still there, and uh, yeah, that, that's a possibility. Yeah. Okay, y'all have been through this recently. So anyway, two things I want to say. One, Festive Funeral Sisters, you know, that was the best thing this church had going because Ann had everything all pretty much in, in order. That was all set up. And you just made one more comment right there <clears throat> about the graveyard people. Um, when I was, when we were at the, at the uh, cemetery, um, I thought the mortuary people were going to put her remains in the ground and and that didn't happen. They're telling for me to do it. And let me tell you, it's heavier than you think, and <laughs> it's deeper than you think. And I thought I was going to fall by myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For for uh, it, what, Glenn, wasn't it uh, mothers that, that we lowered? We actually were the ones that, that lowered. Was my dad. Pardon? That was my dad. We lowered my dad. Uh, I, I think dad or moms, we may have done the same thing when yeah. I was over in Canada. So, yeah. I just wanted to tell you a funny story about a uh, uh, funeral burial. Lance's mother passed in November. She was 103. And um, so we had the, the service for her in December in Spokane. So the family is gathered out at the cemetery. There's snow on the ground. It's about 20 degrees. And uh, people are gathered around this tent. And there's no, the pastor doesn't show. So we're all there. Lance's sister, who had MS, had been sitting out there for I don't know how long. People were bringing blankets to keep her warm. So I said, this is, this is when a, a liturgical background was really helpful. So um, I said to my kids, I said, okay, we're giving her five minutes and then we're going to do this ourselves. So we gave her five minutes, she didn't come. In those five minutes, I'm going, okay, we're going to, I, I said, okay, in my house, in my father's house, I'm going to be anxious. Okay, I get that out of my phone and a, a kind of committal. Uh, Kristen, our daughter, came up with something kind of pretty amazing and talked about um, Mary Oliver's poem, uh, What Will I Do With This One Wild and Precious Life? So we gave her five minutes, she didn't come, and we did it ourselves and sang. The only thing that I thought people would know was Amazing Grace, so we sang Amazing Grace, which would not have been my choice. But you know, it was very, it was a very special thing and probably much more meaningful to the people that were there than it would have been had the pastor come in, I might say, as she showed up in her, in, in, at the uh, service later, as she showed up in her Crocs when it was 20 degrees, her feet would have gotten really cold. <laughs> but one other thing I wanted to say, and I actually think the best thing you can give your family is to have those things planned. And that the service is a service, you know, I think the service is two things. It's comfort to the family, but it's also an expression of the person who has died. And, and I think it also takes pressure when you're in the midst of grief. Uh, now, I knew, for example, my mother wanted me to, uh, to sing uh, in the garden. I, I don't like that. Uh, but it was my mother's favorite. So, uh, she made that known, so I did that, and I did that out of love for her. Uh, so I think that you know, planning these things and picking scripture, for example, that resonates with you as a person in your in your uh, faith journey. Uh, those things are are I think important. It's a gift. I think it's a gift to my kids <laughs> that in the midst of their grief, that they have something that says. Okay, this is this is who mom did. You know, uh, do I want lots of music? Yeah. Do I want luck? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think making those things known to your your kids is uh, is a gift. It's the best gift.
I'm sure we all have so many stories. I'm restraining myself from telling you guys stories, but this is fractionally off topic of planning the memorial service. And I'm coming to you with my Episcopalian background, so help me out in a better reference than I am. Uh, there's this wonderful thing in a prayer book, a Episcopal prayer book, called uh, Prayers at the Time of Death. Do you guys have it? And um, it's, it's a, a brief liturgy that David and I have just really found so deep. We, we hear, you know, so Aunt so-and-so has died. His mom's friend, Elsie, that had been a family thing for a while. You know, she's not family, but kind of has died. And we're like, yeah, well, I feel nothing. And <laughs> I'm sad, but... Uh, and then we would go and we would get out the, uh, the prayer book and we would go to the prayers at the time of the death and just sit in our wherever living room, dining room, and do this liturgy. And uh, it has, and I think I've heard that in this con our context here at the Lutheran Church too, which is about uh, Jesus saving a lamb of your own saving and a child of your own redeeming and all that. And you fill in the name of Elsie. You fill in the name of the loved one every time. There's a spot, and it's it and yet at the end. It enabled us to access deep grief and joy and restoration as well. I, I just look. I'm tearing up. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing for at the time of death or whenever you hear about it. Yeah, it, this is this is a great time to remind or bring alive once again the the scriptural message which is there the you know the scriptural mess or the, the message of christianity uh which is there which is powerful very comforting and uh, inspiring so. i would just like to add a second to what Rebecca said and what you were just saying daryl in that um from the pastoral point of view, sometimes we find that the family, the majority by far and away, are unchurched. And uh, what they want to do is they want to tell stories about the loved one. They want it to be almost 100% eulogy. But um, I think that's where we, as people who grew up with some structure in our worship, should trust that, just like what Rebecca said. It gives us words to say when words don't come easy. And it gives us a message beyond the immediate moment and maybe the intense grief that people are going through. And I always worked with two full side uh, for a service, whether it was a, especially if it was a memorial service and, and not really a funeral. We need to know who it is that has died. I mean, that sounds overly simplistic, but I've been to funerals where it was almost recitation of a liturgy, and it could have been anybody that had died that day. Uh, so we need to be introduced to the person, the preciousness of that life, something of the uniqueness of the person. But that's where you, you have this delicate balance when does the service become all about the life lived and basically a recounting of the history? In the future, we don't know. We're not even going to visit that. And that is a tragedy. And that's where I think our liturgy and our scriptural foundation says, all right, we looked back, we've acknowledged the person, now let's let God get a word in it twice and give us the hope that we need. Yeah, uh, traditionally I'm old enough, and then of course, growing up pastor's family, they tell a lot of history. Uh, in the Lutheran Church, it was a funeral service. Here's the order of it, uh, and then the fellowship that happened was afterwards. And uh, and so so what I think I've seen is that uh, as we've moved toward the term memorial service, we brought more of the life of that person uh, in, 
uh, and at times it goes whoa way over here, you know. Uh, and uh, you know, it's nice if we can bring a, a, a balance back. If it's going to be primarily this um, liturgical service then we better have some great fellowship afterwards, you know, uh, to, to be, so it is a celebration of that, of that person's life. So, so the different ways of doing it, and I, I guess uh, I try to be as flexible as, pos uh, as possible to, to work, uh, I always, do, uh, to work with the family, uh, what's gonna be most effective and helpful for them. I was just reading just what other people mentioned. The important I think it's valuable, it was valuable for me to find out uh, so much, but uh, because the people, my adult kids who were planning my funeral, they are on church. They don't know <laughs> what's happening. I just I think finding it out when the children or other mm -hmm. relatives are yeah. finding this that would have no clue. So and then probably the pastor would help them. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's each family has to try to work out what is most effective uh, for them, and hopefully the pastor is able to work with you uh, in in that way to be helpful where you need help and uh, to be supportive of uh, for what is important also for you. Yeah, what are you? What are your thoughts on the Eucharist as a part of a funeral service? Philosophically, it's a good idea. I didn't grow up with that, and so it's it, it's something new and different to me. But we have communions so often. Uh, regularly, that for me, I don't know that it's needed, but I suspect for a lot of people that whole uh, it, event uh, is is very good for supporting the ongoing sense of life. God with us forever. Yes. I, I just wanted to say to my, my mother, I never wanted to talk to my parents about them dying. And she kept bringing it up from the time she was 70 on. And I just, oh, mom, don't talk about it. And um, when she did pass away, I opened the closet door like she told me to, and there were envelopes taped on the door in the event that I die in Washington. In the event that I die in Minnesota, in the event that I die in Missouri. And then I opened the right envelope, and there was a list of first, first you call the funeral home. Then you call, she had everything numbered out. She had the name of the Lutheran life insurance guy. She had the, she had all these names and telephone numbers. Um, I was so grateful. And then there was another note that said, you know, on the, on the bottom of all these things are who, who's supposed to get them when I'm gone. And she had all the list of her jewelry. And um, really, truly, you are so overwhelmed um, in the amount of time to get the obituary written and get all this stuff planned. Um, it is such a gift to your children to do that and to have that list of Bible verses. That was a spouse. She also instructed me that after she died, that we would have a yard sale at her place. Because <laughs> uh, that's something we do at a I look at her and said, That's not going to happen. She didn't. <laughs> so, so, so for years, she was drinking your life. <laughs> I'd like to get back to the uh, question about the Eucharist and just make a point that when we have had the Eucharist in one of our recent um, funeral or memorial services, and Pastor Seth has said, everyone is welcome, and he even acknowledges all the categories. I think that is a fabulous witness 
to our world and to many people there who do not have a faith tradition to see what Christianity can mean in inclusion and in welcoming children and welcoming people uh, to come forward. And um, so that's in my service, by the way. <laughs> I have served communion at so many services, and I can't tell you how meaningful it is to do that. So I think it's a wonderful idea, and the inclusion of it is, is also a wonderful idea of who we are and how we function every day. Certainly my uh, environmental experience through the years was uh, we only had communion like four times a year. You know, so, so the environment, my environment it isn't one that naturally encourages uh, uh, communion, whatever, 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 you know. I was uh, just going to say, you know, I don't know that everybody has to pen details down to whether you have a yard sale afterwards. You know? But um, sometimes there's family squabbles about what you do or don't do. Um, you know, somebody, you know, maybe a very elderly person has adult grandchildren who never got through the door of the church, or they want to sing Stairway to Heaven or Over the Rainbow. And, um, you know, or I, I know at Gary's dad's funeral, his sister got this idea that he loves sports, so everybody should come to the funeral wearing a shirt from their favorite sports team. Oh. That was just so icky to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I I brought along my Gonzaga shirt and some decent funeral clothes. Yeah. But my daughter and her husband and three children were flying in to the Midwest and they didn't have the capacity. So they just brought the sports shirts, um, mm -hmm. which they were also rolling their eyes at. And then we got there and all this local family who had to drive 10 miles was like, that's just such a stupid idea. I'm not gonna go to a funeral way. And they're sitting there with nothing but their Seahawks jerseys. <laughs> you know, um, and anyway, then some of his uh, siblings said, we brought the whole wear just so they don't, you know, but, but those kind of, there's just some other silly things. Sometimes it's, um, you know, fighting over whatever. And so I think yeah. the planning is, is very helpful to set the tone of, of what kind of celebration. Yeah, and um, each, each, uh, each family, larger family, is unique and there's always, or very often, struggles to get it straightened out. What, what I was going to share, what, one of the neat things that I, uh, we were able to do um, as a pastor, I had an you know, ongoing relationship with the uh, funeral home. And uh, my parents are uh, buried in Eastern Washington. And uh, so we were able to use the uh, uh, hearse from the funeral home, and we drove the body uh, over to uh, to uh, Kennewick. Uh, so we we, we were able to four times. Four times, right? That's your Gwen's parents also. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that that was special. So it's spooky for my, a couple of my brothers. <laughs> Got the body with us? <laughs> I think it might help to realize if you write out a plan, it gives your family a place to start. This, the conversation is reminded of, reminds me of when Cindy called and asked me to be a, one of the people who writes prayers. And I'd never done this before, and I'm like, oh my gosh. She goes, well, there's a, there's a resource that you can use. And so there's an outline for the intercessory prayers that we do in our services and you guys probably all know that but this is me <laughs> and the, each person who's quote unquote writing their prayers is really editing them and adding a current event to it or personal names 
and that kind of a thing. I think if family members know you've kind of got the outline figured out, but they have permission to make to edit it, then that might go a long way towards smoothing out some of the for you to be the boss. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I was a good sister, so <laughs> I've been the boss for a while. <laughs> so, uh, Gwen, you want to uh, share, share the information that was the five, or five wishes. Five, five wishes and some of that stuff? Yeah, you, you can get it online, but I have some copies of it still from when I was a parish clerk. Those of you who attended the classes that we taught on end of life, the five wishes gives you tons of places to share everything you want. And it also has in it your power of attorney, your health care director, all of that is all in one folder. But for us, we did that, but then we kind of changed when we went and bought all our funeral stuff. And I call ours the resurrection files. And I gave a copy of everything to our kids, and they loved it because then they're thinking about resurrection, not death. So, yeah, but that which is a great way to decide. But yeah. Uh, all our kids have a copy of our resurrection file. So. And we and we've uh, outlined who has re responsibility for, for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No point. Also, I think the church office has a form that you can fill out now, and it it's it's very helpful. And the pastor said he will keep it in a file, so when that day comes, there's something somewhere. Just one thought I had to, um, because my husband does not attend church anymore, and my children are children of faith, but they don't have a church they go to. Um, I really do want to direct that, and the thing I keep thinking about is when my grandchildren come, who have a very different experience with church than I have, I want it to be a lesson for them. I want it to be inviting and hopeful, that they know what I believe in is something very powerful in my life. So. I'm kind of bossy anyway, so I don't know how to take control of that. But I really do think that when we have our service, the focus is on God and his message for our children. Right. There, there is also a uh, website called Good to Go, which is <laughs> it's it's uh, similar to, I mean, it's the same name as the Washington yeah, it's, uh, Toll Road thing, but it's a uh, it's a 56-page uh, PDF that you, you the a woman who put it together will send it to you, and it has every detail, like those envelopes taped to the door, of who gets what, who needs to be notified, who has power of attorney, where the will is. I mean, it just it just goes, and then um, they actually uh, support um, a family buying. Uh, you know, five copies of, of this thing or whatever. And then you all sit on the table and you all fill it out together. So everybody knows where everybody's stuff is and who gets what and, and that sort of thing. That 56 pages, I think it would take a toll on me. <laughs> <laughs> I will say um, one of the things I did was uh, when the, when the pandemic started and I had all of the comorbidities that were necessary for me to be one of the first to go, um, I sat down and wrote out what I wanted to, in my memorial service. I wrote a letter to each child. I wrote a letter to my wife because you know in the very early stages of the pandemic, we didn't know if there was going to be a vaccine. We didn't know what was going on. People were dropping like flies all over the place. And I just wanted to be ready because there were things I felt I needed to say that if I could leave something for my children about what I thought about them and how much I admired them and was proud of them. And, and um, uh, <laughs> I was just reviewing that the other day and thinking, this is still good stuff. I should actually just tell them. <laughs> so I did with my son. I did. We, took, we had one of our drive to Seattle and I told him everything that was in the letter. Told him where to find it, what the password was on my computer, and, and everything. So he he has all that information now.
he, he might guess that I've sung at a few funerals. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there are some songs that I not wanted to sing that I sang. Um, but one of the things I've learned as I've gotten older is just to have a more grace for people that they need to grieve in whatever way they, they need to pray. You know, so it's like I'm at, at services and I can know this is way too long. It's a memorial and, and all those eulogies one after another. It's like you can walk up and at one service I was leaving recently, a pastor had walked to take the mic away from me. But I, I just kind of learned to just like, you know, this is what people need to grieve. It's fine. And, and we've talked about it. It's like, you know, whatever you think about, if I'm the first to go, whatever you do, just be there. Although you can miss me now, but I need a little more influence. <laughs> so that's what that's what. Yeah, the, there is a therapy aspect of, of the whole process. Yeah, as humans, we're hardwired for ritual, and we need ritual to to kind of put a cap on things and, uh, and wrap them up. That's why we do graduation, bar mitzvahs. So. Uh, secret terrors, all of those things, is because we need those things. So whether you think you need it or not, you, everybody who's attending your funeral needs a ritual. That being said, I I don't I don't want a standard ELC funeral. I have music picked out. Um, oh, sorry, my brush. <laughs> uh, just because uh, those songs are very meaningful to me, and they would share something with the audience about where my head's at. Every every uh, bulletin or uh, every funeral that I've ever participated in, each one is different. Yeah. Each one is different. Okay. We got it. Thank you. Well, now, hold your signs. Okay, great. Thanks. Right here. And <laughs> you